So the report uh, written for SILIP, it really opened my eyes to a lot of things going on across the whole information profession, which is you know, a really broad area of activity. And this presentation, I want to kind of share some of the insights from that work. And I'm aware that Sandy and Amanda in the previous series of talks did already say quite a lot about artificial intelligence. So I kind of focus on maybe things that they, they didn't say, trying to say some slightly different, more provocative things around that. So but I would hope that people would wish to read the report. That'd be really great. And if they do and want to send me comments, that'd be fantastic. Um, if you don't know us, the Information School is one of the main providers of education to information professionals like librarians in the UK. Uh, we teach information systems, information management, librarianship and data science. So when I was doing the study for SILIP, I think I noticed a pattern that the more technical interviewees didn't really like the term artificial intelligence because it's rather vague. It's been used in multiple ways. There's a lot of hype around it. But it's also, from my point of view, I really like the term. And the reason I like it is because, because it's so controversial, because it's excited so much interest over time. I've been to exactly zero films about machine learning. But we've all been to lots of films about artificial intelligence and it's asking questions about the nature of humanity, isn't it? And there's a really interesting um, project to look at the different ways that different cultures are talking about artificial intelligence. So I think starting with definitions, I'm not looking for one definition. I'm quite excited that there's multiple definitions and there's no real agreement about it. I think in the report, I try to say, well, a lot of this stuff is pretty familiar. We might not have called it artificial intelligence, but a lot of the work that's been done in the search libraries in the UK around text and data mining, supporting digital humanities, training people in data literacy, and all the work around learning analytics and also kind of developing better data about users, if you want to call that library analytics, that's all to me, part of the artificial intelligence story. So I think we already know quite a lot about artificial intelligence. Let's not start from the assumption this is a completely blank sheet of paper that we don't know anything about. Also in our daily lives, in ordinary kind of knowledge work, we're encountering artificial intelligence um, functionality like auto-suggest, auto-correct, tools to correct our grammar, tools making recommendations and ranking searches, even uh, something like Zoom with the captioning it does on uh, talks like this, that's using types of artificial intelligence. Similarly, things we might be using like auto summarization. And what really excites me is the, the really, the growing quality of translation tools, meaning we can access knowledge written in other languages. These are all, I would say, applications of artificial intelligence. And the reason they're possible, the, these, these new tools, is really because Google, Amazon, and, and these websites have got huge quantities of data. That's really what's enabling them to do that. So we're encountering, uh, we've been having a battle, really, with artificial intelligence in alternative ways of search for quite a few years. Um, and we shouldn't forget that history with artificial intelligence that we know a lot about already. At the same time, quite a lot of the interviewees in the project did see a lot of artificial intelligence talk as basically hype. Particularly, say, in the legal sector, some of the really big law firms in the City of London, yes, they're attaching and saying, well, we're doing artificial intelligence, but there seemed to be they weren't doing very much that was new. The technologies weren't particularly mature. And it was more about making the law firms look cutting edge by latching onto the latest kind of technical trend. 
Um, so again, there's a lot of hype around artificial intelligence. I think that's what makes it interesting. But I think we can have a role in reminding people that a lot of that is hype and that we're just talking about things we could do before quite well anyway, potentially. There's some exciting possibilities in the future, but some of it is just hype. And then I'm really interested in some kind of quite critical perspectives from critical librarianship on artificial intelligence. So there's a very great article by Mears and Seal that look at the way that a focus on technologies, which we often do in the library world, we write lots of articles about technology, can perpetuate certain kind of myths and kind of ideologies, such as technological determinism, the idea that you know, everything's gonna change because of technology, there's gonna be a transformation, and really we can't do anything about it. That sort of thinking, technological solutionism, where you, you believe that very complex social problems that we have in our society and globally can be solved by technologies alone. We've probably encountered that many times, like the belief that the one laptop per child project just by giving people computers could solve all our problems. So ideas like artificial intelligence are getting so much hype at the moment, it's so much media coverage. They are ideological. They are making a statement about the role of technology. And we might be quite cautious about how we relate to those. Mirza and Seal really contrast this idea of, um, of uh, a technology-driven future. They see that as hiding really a mask for a kind of white masculine kind of dominance, um, portraying certain changes as rational, neutral, as progress when they are necessarily, and contrasting that with the views, the kind of more human-centered views of our profession, maybe a concern with service, emotion, care work. So while I think AI is a really interesting topic, I do think it's also a very powerful technocratic discourse that we can use. As librarians, I think we should be trying to use it, but we should be using it with care. Again, the work of Crawford over a number of years has really shown that artificial intelligence, we might see that as like something rather immaterial. Actually, the reality of how maybe Google operates using AI is, first of all, it's appropriating and exploiting our data as users. It's exploiting cheap labor, click workers, in the global south it's based on exploitative industry and we had a previous talk in the series from Frederica Luxivera about the environmental impact of the digital actually the, the nature of AI the way that AI is trained using going over and over again training data does have very high energy demands and there is a bit of a concern about the environmental impact of um, AI. AI is an industrial complex and we shouldn't lose sight of that. It's not just, you know, uh, sort of immaterial digital, digitality. And that means I think we have to think in terms of in appraising AI and the digital turn in general, we have to think about the environmental and societal impact of that as well. And then the third layer, of course, is there's been a massive wave of concern about the ethics of AI. One study, even back in 2019, found nearly 100 different statements from governments and technology companies about how to do AI ethically. And we're probably aware of issues such as bias. We know that the AI industry itself contains mostly, is mostly run by males. The data it uses is biased. The algorithms are biased. So we have to think about the way that um, there's a potential for reproduction of bias through AI. There's also an acute issue of 
explainability and accountability around AI because the way machine learning works is a bit hard to say why a result has come about. And if we can't say that, then how can we really explain how a decision has been made? There's a risk of a de-responsibilization as well. Who's accountable if the AI makes a mistake? There's issues of privacy and consent and even of safety and security. So I think there's some quite complex ethical issues around AI and there's been a storm of interest in this very interesting writing. Ifla's statement on AI, which is well worth reading, focuses particularly on the impact on free expression and perhaps the chilling effects of surveillance through artificial intelligence, those effects that might happen. There's certainly a question always about AI, about the idea of, well, how does it affect our human agency? And more directly, perhaps, the power of the big tech companies who are using this technology and then trying to roll it out to different areas of application. How, how can our national governments control these very powerful tech companies? And I think there's a really interesting debate being had around, well, who is responsible for thinking about what is ethical AI? Often it's portrayed as like a technical dilemma for developers, but really it's a societal challenge because the implications of AI affect many stakeholders directly and indirectly. And there's also a debate about what are we trying to do here? Are we just trying to avoid harm just have a neutral effect on society? Or are we trying to use computing for social good? If that's the case, what's our concept of how, say, inequality is reproduced through inequalities in representation in data and artificial intelligence? How does that work? Do we have a sophisticated kind of sociological grasp of how inequality occurs? I know that Oral UK is saying that part of the digital shift agenda is addressing inequality. But I think we've got to think about what's the origin ultimately of inequality? How does it work? How does it reproduce itself? And that's not necessarily something that we always think about, particularly maybe in the academic library sector. So I think our ethical position on this is, it becomes really important. So, these are some, those are some quite critical perspectives on artificial intelligence, asking us some, pointing us to ask some really difficult questions about, about how we relate to this technology. Coming at the issue of what is artificial intelligence, another angle on it that I've been developing a, a bit of work about trying to integrate across a lot of silos of literature, what's going to be the impact of artificial intelligence on higher education as a whole. Um, there's been a lot of talk over quite a few years about artificial uh, intelligence in learning, things like intelligent tutoring systems, which essentially adapt learning materials to people's learning style, or even their kind of mood on a particular day. Automatic writing evaluation techniques, such as you might find in actually Turnitin, or uh, Grammarly, which is always being advertised to me whenever I log on. Um, these, these are using artificial intelligence to help people write. There's a lot of interest in the moment. I mean, you notice that um, JISC have just asked, put out a call for institutions who are interested in using chatbots, not in teaching probably, but more in administration, to keeping in touch with students. And we can also see there's a wide range of applications in things like research. So there's the idea of the robot scientist, which is basically a machine that can perform many, many experiments um, in a short period of time. But it can also intelligently think about changing the, the variables in those experiments. So it's basically doing a huge amount of research in a semi-independent way. In 2019, Springer published the first book, or they, they say the first academic text, which is basically written by artificial intelligence, which is a book 
summarizing the literature about a particular type of battery. Um, and there's also the idea of the smart campus. Maybe um, institutions are really interested in kind of um, um, changing, monitoring behavior in classrooms, maybe prompting people to move, things like that. So in this work uh, published this earlier this year, I was trying to look at what's the wide range of applications in higher education that might happen. There's also some quite interesting research that looks at, well, how likely are these things really going to be to be adopted? Because a bit like the digital shift, if you're going to really go into artificial intelligence, I think it's such a big mind shift potentially in how you think about learning that actually institutions will really struggle to make that change politically. And there's all sorts of cultural barriers to implementing the system. So what is actually going to happen around this academic library? Some of these things could become really big and therefore libraries have to participate. How do we fit into this wider picture of, of how AI might be applied in higher education? So I think that's trying to think is more broadly and then we can look specifically in the library field and in the report, I try to kind of itemize a wide range of things that might be deemed to be artificial intelligence that, that potentially could be used in our field. So we could be using chatbots and voice assistants to talk to our users. We could be analyzing data about users through things like sentiment analysis. I mean, it's not that cutting edge to do that if we want to look at user response to services in social media. Um, there's applications of a very simple technology, really robotic process automation to routine tasks in libraries. There's the importance as AI becomes um, part of employability of the whole student population. I think we've got a role there to play in terms of teaching people about data and AI literacy across the curriculum. We might be managing libraries as smart spaces. Of course, the most obvious application, particularly in the context of research libraries, is in knowledge discovery, be that searching the literature, increasingly the literature is so vast, you know, maybe on one medical condition, half a million published papers, no one can read it all. So just analyzing the literature and making new types of discovery in the literature, that's going to need um, AI. But it's also analyzing data, be that data from our collections, our sort of special collections, AI uh, from uh, government publications, AI on social media data, whatever it is. So focusing on knowledge discovery, I suppose, I remember from, um, we did a report with Stephen Pimfield and Sophie Rutter in 2017 about the future of academic libraries. And I remember one of the interviewees said something to the effect that they thought we might be entering a golden age for libraries. And it strikes me that looking at this area of knowledge discovery, AI offers us so many exciting possibilities. More and more of the world's content is digital, born digital, or is being digitized. We're getting this more accurate translation from more languages, breaking the hold of English as the only language to write uh, scientific works, which I think is a big barrier to us engaging with other ways of thinking across the world. We could be using AI for fact checking. We can use AI for auto summarization of text to enable us to read more quickly. Um, we can get use this idea of adaptivity or personalization that I talked to about in relation to um, um, intelligent tutoring systems to apply that to reading content as well. And ultimately, it seems to me, the direction we're moving in is to think in terms of distant reading tools that, where we can browse whole library collections in an immersive way. That is the kind of endpoint, I suppose, for, for AI 
in our context. And that's such an exciting possibility. And maybe there's even beyond that new ways of discovering knowledge, new ways of encountering knowledge that we haven't uh, had the possibility of doing before. Equally, of course, there's many risks. Um, I won't, I'm aware of the time, I won't go through each of these points, but in particular, I think for the area of knowledge discovery, there are some problems around the intensification of biases in our collections. Our historic collections are very valuable, but they were created in the society that now seems to have some quite problematic values. So how do we deal with that? How do we um, deal with that? How do we deal with the way that AI may privilege, although it opens up a wider uh, range of languages that we can understand, but it can also in exacerbate inequalities. We already know that Global South scholars have um, haven't got the same access to data, open data that we hope that will be achieved by the, the open data movement or open access. How is AI going to really privilege maybe researchers in places like the UK and USA over researchers from the global in the global south? Got to think about these quite big issues. I think in the area of knowledge discovery, just to kind of draw the talk to a close. In the area of knowledge discovery, we've got quite a lot of choices when we're drilling down to like to today's services, really. I've been talking about quite futuristic things. But today's services, I think we can be thinking about licensing proprietary systems, but that's very expensive. We can offer our special collections as data. Maybe that's the best way for us to participate in artificial intelligence. It could be, though, we're more about procuring data supporting data discovery or it could be about more building communities commu building communities that are using ai methods or at least certainly participating in such communities with the excellent advice we can give on things like legal and copyright aspects technical options discovering content or maybe it's a big part of our information literacy and digital literacies has got to be increasingly data literacy and AI literacy. So we've got some big choices here about how to position ourselves to, um, to contribute to the growing amount of activity in most institutions around artificial intelligence across, the, across many disciplines, not just digital humanities, not um, also in obviously computing, but also in many other subjects, starting to use these methods. So how do we get involved with them and support them? That's our, one of our big choices. But to sort of end with a kind of more visionary element, I suppose in an earlier paper, we talked about the paradigm of the intelligent library. And we were thinking in terms of maybe we've got the move just in as you know, digital humanities scholars have been talking about for a while from searching to find a text to read physically to interacting with the full text of library collections. That's, that might be the vision of what the future holds. Or maybe it's something slightly less grand, the living systematic review, where you've defined um, a process where you can refresh your systematic review. Probably there'll be a human in the loop at various stages. But I know in the health sector, they're very interested in this idea of systematic review that can be constantly maintained. Um, and maybe that's the vision we have. But certainly, I suppose my overall message is to think in terms of how we can define a vision for artificial intelligence, how we uh, are not just to passively kind of respond to what other people define it. Let's, let's take hold of this agenda and define it. One of the things I was going to talk about is our, our role in all this, in terms of our, uh, our skills as professional librarians. So I think the, the, the four things, that let's, let's focus on the positive. First of all, 
there's many things we do in libraries that are highly relevant to constructing and supporting artificial intelligence, building the infrastructure for artificial intelligence. So things like understanding of metadata, understanding of the importance of standards, understanding things like information governance, our commitment to information literacy and helping people to really understand complex information landscapes. So I suppose that's one thing that we bring to the scene. The other is something that I've been advocating quite a, for a long time with my students, Twido and Nichols concept of computational sense. And that's not about, you know, I don't think we're going to be writing code. We're not computer scientists. We're not data scientists. But our compute, computational sense is our sense that we know what computing power can do for us. We've got a vision of what the technology could do. That's really what computational sense is about. And then going back to the, the issue of ethics, I think it puts us back to say, Silip have got a very good statement of, I believe, of the values and ethics of the profession. In the academic sector, we don't talk as much about the ethics of what we're doing. But I think we need to do that perhaps a bit more and think about articulating our core values more strongly because they, we're not the only ones talking about data, we're not the only ones talking about information in this area, but we can add a lot of value. And the, and the fourth thing that we really offer, which is great, is things like this are as a profession that um, likes to share knowledge with each other, we have a lot of fora where we do that. So I think we should be very positive about what we can do um, for artificial intelligence and how we can define it. So I, I think I'll stop sharing there. Um, Thank you so much, Andrew, for a really invigorating and thought-provoking presentation, both in terms of what the possibilities are, what the risks are, and also what the opportunities are, but also which of those opportunities we need to pick and choose to begin with as well. And I think that actually leads quite nicely to the, one of the first questions which we have, which is, you mentioned quite a few knowledge opportunities that are uh, available through AI, especially collections of data as the underlying foundation, but also uh, data and digital literacies. Uh, I think you mentioned uh, the automated translation and linked with decolonization of research in that context with Global South, auto summarization of texts and audiobooks is, is quite coming through as well. Uh, where would you start? Where would you want us to choose our position from? It's a tricky question because we're such a diverse audience, aren't we? But for research libraries, the collection as data is an obvious starting point. But as a profession, I think we all have a really strong commitment to information literacy and, and empowering users. And I think we can really get involved in understanding AI ourselves and then helping other people to understand it. And I think there's a really big market for that because in almost every subject in the university, they will increasingly want to use these techniques and it's a big part of employability, not just computer scientists that need to engage with it. So I think we could have a really good role there too. An initial thought. And actually, that links quite nicely into another question, which is about um, literacies and uh, basically the role of library in, in its civic mission. And you mentioned about the ethical issues associated with artificial intelligence. Um, do you see that libraries will have an increasing role in not just talking about the ethics of artificial intelligence within institutions, but also beyond that across our communities as a civic role. Yeah, that seems like, I mean, if we're talking about public libraries, uh, one of the people I spoke to um, for the report ran a maker space. And it seems like that kind of, um, 
unit, which we've got in academic libraries too, is a great way to kind of help people to really engage with things like robotics and artificial intelligence in a very practical way. Um, okay. And we can we can also try out things like, you know, I don't know if you've got one of these voice assistants at home. Actually, I think they're pretty useless, but um, maybe we can uh, you know, adapt them to answer library queries. Um, we can get one that doesn't just look, at, for, look up everything in Wikipedia. Probably be quite good. Good point. There's a question about you mentioning AI being used for fact checking. And the question is do you think AI can have a strong role in the destruction of the fake news culture? That's a very good question. Um, I think a lot of the evidence at the moment is that it's being used quite intensively, as the question implies, to create fake information and you know, deep faked videos and so forth. Um, but then I think it's just as likely to be able to be used in the, in the other opposite direction. I think that's really down to commercial interests that are beyond our control. But I think our role is really to help keep informing people and to just promote that kind of criticality of that information that we has always been what we've been about, as not it's been get people to ask questions about the information they're getting. And that's the best thing we can do is help people think like that. Thank you. Um, there's also a question about, um, you mentioned the librarian's role in the future uh, in licensing proprietary systems. And one of the problems with those kind of systems is the lack of transparency. And I think you mentioned in your conversation about the implicit nature of machine learning algorithms as black box algorithms as well. Um, do you feel that there's a role of librarians to promote transparency and therefore specifically challenge reliance on proprietary systems so that we can actually use things like text and data mining and other things, basically future-proof our efforts as well? Yeah, I think there's also with these proprietary systems, often it's for one publisher's set of works. It's not everything. So I think libraries have got a really important role in informing people about the information landscape, the data landscape, so that they can really understand what the results that they're getting back really mean. I think for example, in the report, I talk a lot about like Dharma as a, a professional association for data managers. But their view of data, I think, is very kind of objectivist. Whereas I think librarians have an understanding of, well, I'm going to use an archival term, provenance, the provenance of collection, which means you understand the, the nature of how it was created and the limits of what it can answer. I think we have to be experts continue to be experts on content and data and information, that's really going to be, to me, that's going to be pretty important for data scientists who often, they're quite technical, they don't, they're good at applying the algorithms, but they don't really understand the nature of the way data was created and the limits of that data. I think that that's the most important role I, I see libraries playing. It's a really interesting point because one of the things that's quite active in my mind is what's the role of librarians in curating that data as well in a way that it's more diverse, it's more well-rounded and the sources and the provenance are well explained as well because as you mentioned, the algorithms are biased, the data is biased, the outputs are naturally going to be biased. So what can we do to reduce it, if not rem completely remove it. There's another question about um, your thoughts on the academic library community taking more control of AI uh, in the wider debate. Um, and what would that process look like? Um, can we actually stand up against the tech giants? Well, I think the answer to that is possibly no on our own. Um, 
But in our sector, we can have an influence. Um, we're not trying to, Google and Amazon and those are going to have a lot of power through artificial intelligence. We can't really stop that. In our own sector, with ed education, I think we can have an influential voice to raise issues like about the ethics of AI, about the real meaning of data, its provenance and those things. So um, getting together as a community is one of the things that librarians do seem to be really good at. We get together, we make statements, we try and influence policy. Um, to me, that's the kind of thing we, we can do as a, um, as a profession that does actually maintain quite strong community. That's not true of many professions. For example, one of the problems I think with the ethics of data science is that data science doesn't really have yet this professional organization that we've had for a long time. Um, there's also a question, and I think I, I can relate to this question about uh, collections as data uh, as a foundation or building block for more further um, AI work. And often the difficulty is where do you start? How do you begin on that journey? How do you establish this as an important priority within your library? Do you have any advice or thoughts on that? Um, my two thoughts are one is obviously projects. I mean, our UK is obviously uh, very much in favor of the idea of librarians being researchers. So I think getting into your digital humanities uh, departments and talking about developing a project together, using data from the library that the library gets hold of, that seems to me like a great starting point. Project, that is how we tend to start with these new things, is a project, and we get build up experience and knowledge in that way, don't we? So I guess that is, is one way into it. Um, I did have something else to say, but I can't remember what it was. But, uh, um, Would you like us to come back to that? Okay. Okay, then there's another uh, question on uh, the role of library in education on this as well, which is um, over time, the libraries have influenced uh, open research and open education debates and have been now considered as partners in that discussion. That kind of partnership still doesn't exist on data science elements. Uh, so we know that there are lots of courses on computer science with data science, et cetera, or in engineering, but libraries are not thought of as contributors to that discussion or, uh, or, or, or lecturing or uh, adding their own views in, in that debate. Is there any way we can shift that? And is that through data route or is that through policies route? Do you mean, I definitely think there's, um, so for example, Sheffield, I'm not picking out Sheffield, do run, our school run a data science course, and it's, it's, it's more focused on technical skills. But I think there's definitely a place in that type of course of case studies. I think a lot of courses like the idea of case studies. So if you've got a case study of uh, a library, getting involved in artificial intelligence. I think that would actually be something a lot of teachers would like to use. I think you could find a lot of, um, and that, going back to the previous question, and that kind of links to the other thought I had about, um, you know, the, the collection as data. I know Sheffield, again, but I'm not picking up Sheffield particularly, but I'm sure it's happening at other institutions. They're thinking about having, they're more and more, um, meetings across disciplines discussing how we relate to artificial intelligence or social scientists, humanities scholars, you've got engineers, computer scientists, you've got many different disciplines coming together and forming a community. And I think the library can play a big part in those kind of discussions. Um, researchers come and go, the library is going to be there 
for a long time. They can contribute a different type of expertise in things like, that we've been doing for a long time, like in the text and data mining area. I know there's colleagues at um, many institutions who've done work on the copyright, supporting people choose open source tools to do data analysis. So there's a lot of um, types of things we can do to get involved in those communities. Um, I think linking back to this agenda about libraries being part of research, actively involved in research projects, researchers themselves, that might be a way to do that within these kind of emerging um, communities around uh, sharing skills in data analysis. Thank you so much, Andrew. That's really, really helpful context around that. Um, we have another question on um, whether you've got any ideas on how libraries in future would merge artificial forms of knowledge generation in the society with the more traditional forms of research and publication processes. Do you envisage a hybrid model in the future where some of the knowledge creation is artificially generated and some of the knowledge creation is still traditional? Wow, that's a, that's a very interesting question. I'm not sure I've, I mean, we've got this book already that's been written by AI. Um, all it did, I suppose, was synthesize um, existing literature. But that's, I've never read that book. I'm not an expert on batteries, luckily. But um, if it can do that, what are the next steps about how AI can have kind of active role in doing research? I mentioned this kind of robot scientist idea. Apparently, it can do more experiments in a year than like 6,000 PhD students. So the scale of these things is massive. How knowledge generated by these means, is, is it really different from what we're already doing? I'm not sure. How do we how do we differentiate? It is a very fascinating question. Yeah, I don't have an answer really. Thank you. Uh, just remind me of this really interesting um, IBM project that happened in 2019, where um, they had a live debate competition uh, on whether we should subsidize public schools with the world champion of debating and an artificial intelligence uh, entity through an earpiece of the other debater. And what was really enlightening is that the AI had more facts, but less emotion. And therefore, eventually, people were swayed more towards the emotion side. Uh, and also, there was an interesting dynamic about actually sometimes less is more, and you don't convince people through facts, but few arguments which are well crafted. However, there are also counter arguments on AIs are also getting quite strong on emotional calibration as well. So it's such an interesting landscape to keep an eye on and how things evolve over time as well. Um, I'll share a link if anyone is interested in watching that debate as well. I'll conclude by asking one last question, Andrew, from my own cheeky side, if that's okay, and which is on the um, element of how bold should libraries be? So how bold should we be institutionally in making this our agenda when many people think of it as an IT agenda or an academic agenda? Yeah, that is a good question. I think it's fair enough for us to assert, if we can articulate clearly what our role is, I went through a few different types of things we could do. I think those are all very positive contributions. I guess increasingly librarianship is about collaboration, isn't it? Everything we do, we're collaborating with academics and other service units like research services and computing. So I don't think we have to be bold in the sense of pushing anyone else aside. We still, but I think people will respect the fact that we've got a, a position and a, quite a big contribution to make. That is absolutely true. Collaboration over competition, but 
being also open and clear on what our role and responsibility in that discussion is.